All right, so chapter four is on integration. 4.1, we are going to start talking about antiderivatives and indefinite integration. So for those of you who have taken calculus class before, uh, this is where it starts to get a little more complicated. This is, this is calculus. You know, derivatives are really the heartbeat of calculus, but integration is where we really start to do real work, okay? So the objectives for this section are to write the general solution of a differential equation, uh, use indefinite integral notation and uh, for antiderivatives, to use basic integration rules to find antiderivatives, and to find a particular solution of differential equation. Now, this will really be the last time we use antiderivatives. We don't really use the term antiderivatives that much. Uh, after we talk about them and talk about what they are and how to use them, we'll strictly be talking about integration. Okay, so when we integrate, what we're doing is finding an antiderivative, but we don't really say it. Okay. So what is an antiderivative? Well, an antiderivative is a function, and we're going to call it capital. Okay. All of the functions that we talked about up till this point, we always use lowercase letters, right? So it's f of x, g of x, h of x. It's always lowercase. When we take the antiderivative, we're going to make it a capital letter, okay? So we're going to find that function, capital F, whose derivative is little f, okay? So if we've got some function, little f, we want to find the big F that corresponds to the little f being its derivative, okay? So what I'm saying is, here we have the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Right? We know this. That means that big F is x cubed when little f is 3x squared. So x cubed is the antiderivative of 3x squared. Why? Because 3x squared is the derivative of x cubed. So if one is the derivative, the other one is the antiderivative. They're like inverses of each other. Okay? Does that make sense? So if I were to ask you, what is the derivative of, say, I don't know, 6x to the fifth? What's the derivative of that? 30x to the fourth. Okay? So if I know that 30x to the fourth is the derivative of 6x to the fifth, can I say that 30x to the fourth is the antiderivative of 6x to the fifth? I'm just going backwards, okay? Now, I wouldn't say the. I have to be careful what terminology I use. Notice that it's an antiderivative, not the antiderivative. There's not only going to be one. There's going to be an antiderivative. So be careful in your terminology. So if F prime, capital F prime is little f, then capital F is an antiderivative, okay? So this is how we write it. If f prime caps is equal to little f, then capital F is an antiderivative. Okay? Now notice I did say it's and not the, because notice these three different cap f's. You got x cubed, x cubed minus 5, and x cubed plus 97. If you take the derivative of each one of those, what is the derivative? Right, the derivative of f1 is 3x squared. The derivative of 2 is 3x squared. The derivative of 3 is 3x squared. They all have the same derivative. Therefore, if I look at 3x squared and say, what's its antiderivative? Well, all of those could be an antiderivative, right? Because they all lead to that same derivative. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we can add a constant 
because what's the derivative of a constant? Zero, right? So that really doesn't change anything as long as that function has a constant on it. So what we're going to do is when we take that antiderivative, we're going to add that plus c on the end of it. And that's going to allow us to say the antiderivative as opposed to an, an antiderivative because now we're adding a constant to it. And that constant can be any constant, right? So the way they write this in theorem 4.1 is if capital F is an antiderivative, then G is an antiderivative if and only if it's written in the form of F plus C. So I can create an infinite number of antiderivatives just by adding a constant to the one antiderivative I know. Okay? X cubed plus 3. X cubed minus 7,438. X cubed plus pi. All of those antiderivatives to 3x squared. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody grasping that concept. Okay. This is a very important concept. Plus C, I can't stress the importance of plus C. Okay. It makes a difference. So using that theorem, we can represent an entire family of antiderivatives, right? By adding that constant, that plus C. And we're going to call that constant a constant of integration. Okay, so it's not like you have to say, oh, plus the constant of integration. You play, say plus C, everybody knows what it is. But it is called the constant of integration. So cap F plus C is going to be the antiderivative of little f. Okay? And all that means is that big F prime is equal to little f. Okay? Now, that's the general antiderivative, G. And it's called the general solution, the gx equals, you know, function plus c. And see we have this differential equation where we've got some derivative or some uh, differential g prime, which is just what? gx or uh, g dy, what, however you want to write it is, dg dx, because it's the function g with respect to x, right, equals 2x. So this is a differential equation, okay? Although g, they say in x and y, because g is still y, right? Math is just so complicated, isn't it? So if you look at these, anytime you've got a prime in your equation, we call it a differential equation. Okay, if you've got a derivative in your equation, it's called a differential equation because it uses differentials. It's got dy, it's got dx. Okay, and we can solve differential equations. All right. So if we've got y prime equals two, we want to find the general solution of that. So we need to find a function whose derivative is 2. Well, the function itself is just 2x, right? So I know that 2x, the derivative of 2x is 2, right? So that gives me that y equals 2x. That's an easy one, of course. If you've just got a constant, you know that you get that from taking it from 2x or from 4x or whatever. Constant times x is just the constant when you take the derivative. So to get the, con the general solution, we add the plus c, okay? And that's from theorem 4.1. So that's the general solution of the differential equation, okay? Not super difficult as long as the derivative up there is not super challenging, right? If it's constant, well, yeah, that's easy. If I give you something really wacky, you know, in a fraction, then you're like, I hate you. You know, so. But notice that if we were to graph all of the 
general solutions with the plus C, changing the C's, then all we get are a bunch of parallel lines, right? Because they have the same slope. It's the slope of the tangent line is the same. They have the same derivative, right? It makes sense that it's just a bunch of parallel lines. How many parallel lines are there? It's an infinite number of parallel lines, right? That's why there's an infinite number of solutions. Okay? So remember, graphically, we can always represent our answers as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about notation. So if we're solving a differential equation in the form dy dx equals a function, it is convenient to write it in that differential form, dy equals fx dx. And the reason we like this form is because we can start to do uh, anti-differentiation, which is a word that no one uses. We say integration, okay? Uh, and we're talking about indefinite integration at this point. Does anybody know the difference between definite and indefinite integration? How many of you have had calculus before? A few of you know the difference between indefinite and indefinite. It talks about boundary endpoints and things like that. But right now we're just talking about indefinite integration, and that's when we deal with C's. That's when we've got the plus C, when we don't know what that constant is. That's the indefinite part. So anytime we do indefinite integration, our, we know our answer is always going to have a plus C. Okay? And it's really important. If you don't have a plus C in your answer, when we do indefinite integration, it's not correct. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Really? <laughs> there you go. Plus capital C. Yes, web assign is, like I said, it's a pain. Yet another reason to not like web assign. Correct. We do. It's not that it's not that we wind up with a definite plus C. It's that we wind up with an actual value. We talk about when we do definite integration, we're really talking about finding the area under a curve, and that's what and that's what definite integration really does is it finds the area under a curve. So it's going to be a number. So when we do definite integration, we just get a value. So there's no you don't get a variable, you don't get a plus C, you just get 40, you know, a number, which will represent an area. Okay. All right. Oh, there. Notice that little sign. That is the integration sign. That's a bigger version of it. Uh, basically, it's just like a really long, skinny S. You'll see it, you'll do it, you'll, everyone will wind up with their own little version of it, you know, some will be more S-y, some will be more liney, you know. It really doesn't matter as long as you know what it is and I know what it is, you know. Everybody does it a little different, so just be aware that it's an integration sign and technically it does just kind of look like that, okay? So. If we have y equals the integral of little f of x dx, well, that's just the antiderivative of little f. What's the antiderivative of little f? Big F. General solution, though, plus c, okay, because it's indefinite integration. So we call whatever we're taking the integral of, the integrand. So it's important to recognize that word so you know what the integrand is. And the dx always tells you what your variable of integration is. It's what you're taking the derivative with respect to, right? When you talk about dy dx, you're differentiating y with respect to x. So when you do the differentials, it just tells you what you're integrating with respect to. Okay, so you're going backwards from differentiation, so it's still the same type of deal. You're just looking at the different variables. If you have a variable other than that variable of integration in your integrand, what are you going to do? How are you going to treat it? How would you treat a variable in a function if you were integrating or if you were differentiating it? And it wasn't the variable of differentiation. 
like if I had y equals xt and I wanted dy dx, what would that be? Assuming that t, you, you don't know that t is not a function of x. t is not given as a function. In this case, you treat it as a constant because you don't know what it is. You're not given that it's a function, therefore you treat it as a constant. So that would just be t. Right. So same deal with integration. If you've ever got a variable in your integrand that is not your variable of integration, then you treat it like a constant as well. Okay? Assuming that you know it's not a function of the variable that you're doing. So this expression is read as the antiderivative of f with respect to x. No, it's not. It's read as the integral of f. Like I said, no one ever says antiderivative at this point. We just say the integral. It's the integral of f with respect to x. That dx is always with respect to. Uh, if you've got a calculator like a TI-89 or a TI-92 or an Inspire, you're always going to do comma x with respect to. The comma always means with respect to uh, when you're using those higher level calculators uh, to check your work, not to get the answers, right? Just to check your work. So, you know, I've gotten to where when I use my calculator, I actually say it in my head as I'm typing it. Integral 2x plus 3, you know, with respect to x. And I actually say with respect to when I hit the comma. So, you do it with limits too, limits with respect to, you know, whatever. So, anyway. The term indefinite integral is a synonym for antiderivative, which we will use almost exclusively. So, you just take that word out of our lexicon. Well, we'll keep it in there, just in case, so we know what it is, but we'll quit using it. All right, basic integration rules. Notice it says integration rules, not anti-differentiation rules. So, here we go. If we integrate f prime, cap f prime, we just get cap f. Well, yeah, because what is f prime? It's little f. Well, we know that the integration of little f is big f. So this is just kind of a, oh, huh, what? Yeah, well, that goes without saying, okay? This tells us that integration is just the inverse of differentiation, but we've kind of defined it that way so it makes sense. Here we have that differentiation is the inverse of integration. Therefore, if we take the derivative of the integral of little f, what should we get? Little f. It's no different than saying that the inverse of f of x is x, right? That's how inverses work. You plug something in, you get the same thing out. So if you differentiate the integral, all you get is the integrand. Right, so if I said, what is the derivative of the integral of 7x plus 3 over 8x minus 7 dx? It better just be 7x plus 3 over 8x minus 7. It's just the integrand because they're inverses of each other. Differentiation and integration. We hate to use the term cancel each other out because they doesn't really cancel each other out. But, you know, it's kind of like when you do natural logs in E and, you know, when you're doing those rules where the natural log of E to the fifth is 5 because they're inverses of each other and the natural log and the E cancel each other out, but not really, you know, same kind of deal. It's not really canceling out, but in your brain you can think of it that way. This one 
is not that. This one is what we're talking about, where we differentiate the integral of f of x and just get the f of x out. That's what we were doing. We just got the f of x out. Okay? This is just saying if we integrate the derivative, what do we get? Right, which is just y, if you look at it that way. Because the dx and the integral cancel each other out, right? <laughs> this part, <laughs> you know, you think about the canceling thing that's not really canceling. And all you're left is the y, which in this case is cap f. Okay? So here is a summary of your differentiation rules that we know and how they correspond to the integration rules. So what's the derivative of a constant? Therefore, the integration of zero is a constant. Okay? Notice they're just exactly backwards. What is the derivative of a constant times x? Just the constant. So what's the integration of a constant? Constant times x plus c. Okay? Kf, where f is a function, the derivative is k times f prime. Well, yeah, that just tells us that we pull the k out and then differentiate the function. Same deal with the integration. We pull the constant out and then integrate the function. So this just tells us that we pull constants out before we integrate. Makes it easier, okay? The sum, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, right? Same goes for integration. The integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. And notice it's kind of like its distribution with the dx. Notice that the whole thing is in parentheses with the dx. So when I break this up, both of these terms have to have a dx in them. It's not like I gained a dx. This is just distribution. Okay? Don't think of it as, well, where'd that extra dx come from? It's no different than if you had to distribute, you know, two through a polynomial or something. Okay? And then here is the big one. We know how to differentiate x to a number. We bring the number out front and we subtract one from the exponent, right? So what's the converse of that? We divide by one more than the variable and add one to the variable. Okay, let's take a look at how that works. Say I've got the integral of x to the fifth. By this rule, what I want to do is I want to add 1 to the variable. So that's going to be x to the 6th. And I want to divide by that variable and then add a constant. Does that work? Let's see. How do I test it? I can take the derivative, right? And see if I can take the derivative, do I get back to x to the 5th? So what's the derivative of x to the 6th over 6? The 6 over 6 will cancel. You're just left with x to the 5th. C goes to 0. Okay? So it does work. So you just take, add 1. With differentiation, we subtract 1 from the variable. With integration, we add 1. That makes sense. We multiply by the exponent with differentiation. We divide by the exponent with integration. Okay? All right. Any questions on that? Here are your basic integration rules for your trig functions. Derivative of sine is cosine. Therefore, the integral of cosine is sine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Therefore, the integral of positive sine would have to be negative cosine. 
derivative of tangent is secant squared, therefore the integral of secant squared is tangent. Derivative of secant is secant tangent, therefore the integral of secant tangent is secant. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared, therefore the integral of cosecant squared is negative cotangent, and the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent, therefore the integral of cose cosecant cotangent is negative cosecant. Now notice, just because I can differentiate a function doesn't mean I can integrate it. I can only integrate those things that come from differentiating. Okay. So I differentiated secant and got secant tangent, right? Nowhere over here do you see the integral of secant. I can't just integrate secant. Why? Because there's no function that gives me the derivative secant. Okay? Correct. So I can only have these pure basic integration rules for those pure basic differentiations. Okay, And that's key, because you'll see things and you'll be like, well, I can differentiate you know, cosecant all day long. Why can't I take the integral of cosecant? Because there's no function that spits cosecant out as its derivative. Okay, It's key to learn and make sure you have in your brain that the only things that we can strictly integrate are those things that are strictly differentiated out. Okay? Now, why is it, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I guess I don't understand why that's the case, because of all, you know, like sequence is just one of the cosines, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then that can't be derived. One over cosine? Over. Is there a function that spits out one over cosine? Right? That's, that's, that's all of a sudden you're talking about a quotient. Right, so that, that's not the same thing. It's not the exact function, it's a different function. Because even though it looks like it and it has cosine in it, it's not the same function, and it has to be the same function. Absolutely. Okay? Because, I mean, yes? No. A lot of times you can manipulate it and you can turn it into a form. Uh, at this point, I don't think they'll give you any that you can't strictly do, uh, but there may be some that you have to play around with converting things over to sine and cosine and you know getting them simplified down and putting them in a different form, particularly with the trig ones. Because um, it may not be in the form, you know, secant squared. So what if they gave you, what is the integral of, say, how can I write that? Say, tangent squared. Cosecant squared, theta d theta. So that looks like, oh, well, I can't do that. Right, that's going to become sine squared over cosine squared and one over sine squared, sine squares will cancel out, and what's 1 over cosine? Secant. And I know that one. So you may have some that come, you, where you have to do a little bit of manipulation, something like that, just using some of your trig knowledge. And I'm not even 100% sure that, that there are any like that on there, but right, don't look at it and automatically assume, oh, I can't do that particularly with trig, because trig is so easy to manipulate a lot of times, okay? All right, so let's describe the antiderivative of 3x. 
Right. So let's integrate 3x. What's the integral of 3x dx? So what's our rule for doing constant times a variable? Well, I know I can pull the 3 out. Not that it's completely necessary, but I know I can do it. So how do I do x? What was my rule? Add 1 to the exponent and divide by the exponent. So x squared divided by 2 times 3 plus c. Does that make sense? Using that power rule, we just increase the exponent by 1, divide by that number, add the plus c. No. So what I'm getting at is my first instance was something just uh, x, three, x. Three halves x. Well, maybe it's x cubed just because it's all the three in front of it. Right. You have to remember the difference. No, and you're going to see this a lot more frequently where you've got fractions. You know, it happens a lot more in integration than it did in, in uh, differentiation because there was no reason to have them in differentiation. You know, you weren't dividing by anything, you were multiplying. So you'll see it a lot more in, in integration. <laughs> you'll see it almost constantly. You know, you might see, you know, what's what's the integration of, you know, 3x squared? That, be that would, would be, you know, x cubed plus c. Because then you raise it by 3 and divide by 3. So we like those because they give us nice clean numbers, but that's not that's not the norm, no. Okay. All right, so here is the general pattern of integration. You got your original integral, you rewrite it in some form that looks like we can use. You know, if it's trig, we manipulate it and get it into a form that we like. Uh, if it's not, we put it in a form where we factor out the constant and all we've got left are uh, integrals of powers. If it's things being added together, we separate it into multiple integrals, which is not strictly necessary, but until you get used to doing them, a lot of times it's easier to go ahead and rewrite them as multiple integrals, uh, and then integrate. And then once you've integrated, make sure to simplify any fractions uh, and simplify your answers, okay? Let's do a couple of problems real quick. What if we've got the integral of 6x plus 4 dx. So I'm going to start by doing what? Well, I can't take the 6 out first because it's there's two different parts, right? Let's start by rewriting it as two integrals, right? Integral of 6x dx plus the integral of 4 dx. Like I said, this is not a strictly necessary step. Once you get used to doing these and you recognize that you can just integrate each piece, but I want you to recognize what I'm doing, so I'm going to do it step by step by step, okay? So now we can take out the 6. So what's the integral of x, x squared over 2, and you've got the 6. What's the integral of just dx? It's just going to be x, right? So you've got 4x. And then what do we need on the end? Plus c. And then our last step is to simplify that fraction.
Mm -hmm. No, because that was just that's part of the integration process is using the dx up. And now we can test and say, what's the derivative of 3x squared plus 4x plus c? Derivative of 3x squared, 6x. Derivative of 4x, 4. Derivative of a constant, 0. So we do get back to 6x plus 4. And at this stage, it's handy to always differentiate your answer. Make sure you get back to where you started. It's handy 10 years down the road if you're ever doing them, you know, even the more complicated ones. Uh, it tends to be more handy with the, the more complicated ones, okay? So, initial conditions and particular solutions. This is where we get to actually solve for C. All right, so we've seen that the integral of fx has many solutions. Actually, it's got not just many, it's got infinitely many. Uh, this means that the graphs of any two antiderivatives or integrals of f are vertical translations of each other, right? Here's one, here's another, here's another, here's another. They're just moved side to side. For example, 4.2 shows the graphs of several antiderivatives of this form, 3x squared minus 1. So we integrate 3x squared minus 1 dx, get x cubed minus x plus c. Each of these antiderivatives is a solution, right? For each C, we just get a vertical movement, okay? What do you mean? It's always a vertical movement. Those were derivative lines as opposed to answer lines. Okay, this is, those were the, those are like little f lines as opposed to big f lines. These are? No, big f as opposed to little f. I know what you're talking about. You're talking about here. It's, they're not, they're, these are moved up. Oh, okay, okay. The lines are just horizontal and parallel, but. Right, they're still vertically moved up. Okay. They still look like they're shifted left, right, because they're vertical lines. They points, because they're linear, they can look either way, <laughs> but they're really just vertically shifted. All right, so in different applications, uh, we're given generally enough information to determine a particular solution, uh, but what we need to know is an initial condition. So what's going on at the beginning of, of whatever's happening? So for example, if we look at 4.2 there, uh, only one curve passes through a particular point, 2, 4, right? So at 2, 4, notice there's only one curve that passes through that point. So if we're given that as a condition, that the curve passes through 2, 4, then that necessarily locks that one curve in and gives us that particular C, okay? So if we've got an initial condition, F of 2 equals 4, then that tells us it's not really an initial, I don't know why it's called an initial condition. Initial generally gives you a, a zero, but Whatever, if they want to say initial, they can say initial. Uh, a condition, I'm going to call it a condition. If we're given a condition, we can plug it in and solve for C. Does that make sense? Because C is the, really the, the one unknown I don't have if I'm given F of 2 equals 4. 
because f of 2, I just plug in 4 for f of x. 2 is our x. C becomes the only unknown. Okay? So we get 8 minus 2 plus C equals 4, implying that C is equal to negative 2. So we plug that C in, and it tells us that our particular solution for this problem is x cubed minus x minus 2. Okay? You see this a lot of times with uh, differential equations. Who here is going to have to take DE? DE is all about initial conditions. Okay? It's all about what's going on at boundaries. You have boundary conditions, initial conditions, things like that. And you need these things to be able to find these constants, these, uh, these different constants of integration. Sometimes you've got uh, not just ODEs and, you know, first order, you've got second order. So you need not only boundary conditions, but you need initial conditions and boundary conditions. You know, you need multiple different sets of things going on because you've got multiple integration constants at the same time. You know, so they, they become really important to application problems because if you don't have those initial conditions and those boundary conditions, then all of a sudden you're talking about, well, you know, it's just a system that could be infinitely weird, you know, but because I lock down what's happening on the ends and what's happening at the beginning of the system, then I can say this is what's going to happen at any given time generally, okay? All right, so here we have f prime of x equals 1 over x squared. Find the particular solution that satisfies the initial condition that f of 1 equals 0. Okay, now, reading this, would you be able to solve this? How are we going to set this up? What are we looking for? Nobody knows? Nobody knows? Okay. So we're given f prime. What is f prime? What's another way of saying f prime? Well, that's true. But it's just a little f, right? That's how we defined the derivative of big prime of f prime, or the derivative of f was just little f. Okay? And we know that big F is the antiderivative or the integral of, that looks like big F, doesn't it, of little f. So them writing F prime is just another way of saying little f, okay? It's an integration problem because we're looking for a solution to this differential equation, f prime. If f prime is what the equation is, I'm looking for an f that satisfies f prime. The integral of lowercase fx. But I'm looking for cap f. I'm looking for the uppercase f because that's going to be a solution to f prime. It's like saying if the derivative of x equals x cubed over 3, find y. Find a solution to that. That's what I'm saying here. If f prime is 1 over x squared, find an f that's 1 over x squared. Okay? Well, 1 over x squared is just a little f, so I'm going to say the integral of 1 over x squared is capital F. Out 
Absolutely, we're going to rewrite it as x to the negative 2 dx. We add 1 and divide by that number, which is negative 1. And then plus c. Whatever the new power is. And this is going to be my f of x. So we can just say that that is what? Negative 1 over x plus c. Right, because remember, the integral of the derivative is just the function. That was one of the things that we wrote. That was kind of the, well, duh thing, you know. Yeah, that's how we kind of defined integration. Uh, so if we have f prime and we want f, we just integrate it. Yeah, that's what that is. That is f prime, that's the derivative of f. Okay. So if you're given the derivative, how do you find the antiderivative? You, you integrate it. I guess my whole confusion is why did they give us a capital F? What was, they, why did they write it that way? Good question. Because, it, I mean, would anything have changed if they said find the general solution of lowercase f prime? That's it's not a, it's, the reason they wrote it like that is because if you write it as lowercase f, it's not a differential equation. They want to write it as a differential equation because then you can solve it. If I just write f of x equals 1 over x squared, it's not really something I can solve. It's not something, it's just an equation. Okay. This is a differential the equation. Us the it's telling us, hey, this is a DE, I can solve it. And I can solve it by using integration. Okay. That's, that's, regardless of if they hadn't wrote it out, that would really be, here's a problem, solve it. That would be generally why they would write it in this form. In this way, they could have just said lowercase f of x and said, here's a function, you know, find the big F that corresponds to it. But they like to write things as DEs. Okay? So now that we have our cap F, which is just the function, we can use our initial condition to figure out what c is. So f of x is equal to what? f of x is equal to 0. x is equal to 1. So negative 1 plus c. So c equals 1. So our particular solution is going to be negative 1 over x plus 1. Correct. That's the one of the infinitely many that works for this problem, given that initial condition. That's the particular solution. So would this be definite integration? No. No? No. This is indefinite integration with a boundary condition. Which allows us to give us a definite answer. Which allows us to get a particular solution. Correct. Definite integration doesn't even give you a function. It gives you a number. Like I said, when you do definite integration, you're really talking about a different type of problem, a different reason for doing it. Okay. But just as, just as effective and just as a lot of times actually more more applicable to problems. So, but we'll see that here, in, uh, probably not today, but next week. Is, is this one of the 
one of those um, types of problems that we, once we know how to do definite integration, this is no, no, sure not at all. You will use you will use both of them equally. Okay. Yeah, you definitely still need to know how to do this even after you learn how to do definite integration. So here are the different graphs for that. And you get one particular solution when C equals 1. So that's kind of nice. All right. Any questions on basic antiderivatives and indefinite integration? Not yet. We still have uh, some homework to do, right? Oh, we are going to start on definite integration today. Nice. So 4.2 is area. So we want to learn how to use sigma notation to write and evaluate a sum. Who here knows how to do summation using sigma? You know what sigma is? Something like that. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll understand the concept of what area is. Who here has a general concept of what area is? If you don't raise your hand, I'm going to give you a zero in this class. If you, everyone knows what area is, right? Length times width. We know what it is. We want to be able to approximate the area of a plane region, okay? Uh, not just a square region or a triangle or something that we've got a formula for, but a plane region. And then we want to find the area of a plane region using limits, okay? So we may not do definite integration in this section. So this is giving us the ability to find the area of a shape that is not regular shape. Yes. Assuming we know the function of the curve that's generating it. In this part, probably not. All right, so sigma notation. We want to talk about this because it's a way to add a bunch of things together, kind of series, sequency kind of thing. We'll do this a lot. Cal2 is riddled with this, okay? Uh, it's going to be the bane of your existence in Cal2 is sequences and series. Maybe some of you love it. I hated it. It's, it was my least favorite thing I ever did in college, and it was in Cal2. And if I haven't stressed to you how bad Cal2 is, let me stress it again. Cal2 is awful. It's an awful, awful class. You're going to hate it. Blech. Okay, now that that's out of the way. Sigma notation is called sigma notation because it uses the letter sigma. It's a Greek letter. Uh, it looks like this. No one writes it like that. That's really pretty. Uh, you'll see it written basically like that. Okay. What it means is that you're summing all of the terms that's associated with it. So you've got some term, we call it AI, not artificial intelligence, A sub I, artificial sub-intelligence. Uh, and then we're going to take I and we're going to start it at some value and go to some other value. So I is called the index of summation. It doesn't have to be I. It can be N. It can be B. It can be smiley face. It doesn't matter. It's the index of summation. It's a dummy index. It doesn't matter what letter it is letter. It doesn't matter what number it is. It doesn't matter what letter it is uh, or what symbol it is for that matter. It's just like any other variable. It can be anything you want it to be. Uh, but generally we use I's, J's, and N's. Those tend to be the three that you see most often. Uh, the top letter is uh, the upper bound. So your bottom letter or your bottom number is the lower bound. Your top number is the upper bound. So I equals a number. That bottom number is how where you start from. And the N is the top number. It's where you're going to. Okay? So what this means is A sub 1, A sub 2, A sub 3, A sub 4. These are just the fourth, third, second, first term that you're being generated by this whatever. And you go to the nth term. Okay? 
Well, n will be whatever the top number is. For example, say you have just the sum of i from i equals 1 to, to 6. So we're going to start from 1, plug in 1 for i. So we get 1. Then we go to the next number, 2. We go to the next number, 3, 4, 5. Stop at 6 because we go from 1 to 6. And you get, what, 11, 6, 7, 7 plus 7 plus 7, 21. And now we look at i plus 1. So if we start at 0, we plug in 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. Go to the next number, 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. Go to the next number, 3. 3 plus 1, no, 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. 5 plus 1 is 6, and we stop at 5. Add all that together, 7 plus 7 plus 7, still 21. Now here we have j squared. Starting at 3, going to 7. So 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared, 7 squared equals something I'm not going to do. <coughs> really? It can be complicated when you start doing manipulations where you're adding sums together, but generally on the whole, until you get into upper level maths where you're having to combine them and changing your uh, starting points on some and changing, you know, it can get really complicated, but basic sigma notation is not too bad. So if we plug in k equals 1, so here notice we went i, j, k, dummy index, doesn't matter what the letter is, okay? So k equals 1. So notice here 1 over n. What is n? n is whatever we're going to. So it doesn't have a value, right? It's just going to stay n. So we start with 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, so, you know, 1 squared. Well, they didn't even do 2. So 1 squared plus 1, 1 over n, 1 over n. So you just have this series of things. You can't even add them together because it's got an n in it, but that's okay. That's just a series of things. Mm -hmm. same, day, same way with E. F of xi, delta x. So i is 1. That just means that x sub 1, you plug into f of x, right? x sub 2, x sub 3. You're just adding all your f, fx, delta x's together, OK? All right, so we want to see different properties of sigma notation. So first property, if we've got a constant, constant can come out. So k times a sub i, pull the k out. The sum of sums is the sum of sums. That's almost like one of those well, yeah, but it kind of is. It makes absolute perfect sense. If you add things together, you can add things together. You can break it up into different sums. So if you've got one thing and one thing, you can break it apart into two different things still being added together. There's no reason not to be able to do that. All right, here are some summation formulas that are handy to know. They'll be handy to know working on your homework, things like that. Not necessary for a test. No one, I, I don't think I ever had to memorize these for anything. Generally, they're given to you as formula sheets, things like that, if you ever need to know them. Uh, I, I won't give you that you need to know this on a test at all, okay? Know that they exist and know where to find them if you need them, okay? So I squared from 1 to n will always give you this. I will always give you this. I cubed will always give you this. So using this information, can you tell me what the sum of the first 100 numbers is? I 
I didn't tell you that. I just said, what's the sum of the first 100 numbers? One through 100, what's the sum? One plus two plus three plus four plus five, what's that sum? You can use one of these formulas to figure that out. You got a hundred times one hundred and one divided by two. Mm -hmm. The guy who figured this out was in grade school. He, I, I forget who it was. He's a mathematician, famous mathematician. But I can't remember who it was. Teacher assigned this problem and he's like it's whatever and she's like uh what and he's like well all you got to do is blah, 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 blah. You know, show, i mean he, literally he was like a kid and when he derived this i have no idea he's smarter than i am but it works yes certified so, there, I mean, I can show you the proof of it, but I, I don't know how. Yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, kind of a, yeah, it's like just, if you just add this number, you know. But I mean, if you think about it, like, what is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4? Right? So, what's, if that's 4, so that's 4 times 5. It's 20 divided by 2. It's 10. Right? What? So if you add add 5 to that, what do you get? So, well, you got, if you add 5, you're talking about the first 5 digits, right? And you got 15. So that's 5 times 6 is 30. 30 divided by 2, 15. So you add 6, then you get 21. 6 times... 7 is 42. 42 divided by 2? 21. It always works, but... No idea why. You know, well, I mean, I could show you. I could do the proof, but... I want to see it. Well, I'm not going to do it right now because I don't have it ready. But I, I can bring it next... I can bring it on, on uh, Monday. But uh, it, it's, it's not really a hard proof. But it's hard if you think about who came up with it. You know, could you have done this in sixth grade? You know, yeah, barely, yeah, barely have just memorized your multiplication tables, and you're like, oh, but no, let me tell you, you know, you think you're a teacher, sit down, you know, <laughs> let me school you. Oh. Yeah, exactly. She was like, I'm not. So here's here's one. We're gonna evaluate this. We're gonna say, what is i equals one to 10 of i plus 1 over n squared. So this is just going to be i equals 1 to 10 of i plus 1 over 100, right? Because n was 10. So I can pull the 1 over 100 out, and I've got i equals 1 to 10 of i plus 1. <coughs> well, this is just 1 over 100 of the sum from i equals 1 to 10 of i plus the sum of i equals 1 to 10 of 1. Well, I know this formula is 10 times 11 divided by 2, and this is 
10 times 1 by formula 1, which is a constant is just c times n. And you got 1 over 100, so that's going to give you 110 divided by 2 plus 10, which is 55 plus 10, which is 65 over 100. which is going to be what? Thirteen over twenty? So for problems like this, a lot of times you can break them up using all of your rules as opposed to trying to work them all out. Because if I let n be 10,000, it's not like I can write 10,000 terms out can, but you, know, you might be done next year. Okay? So you see how you can break apart these kind of problems. You may have a problem like this in your homework. If I had to guess, I'll say you're going to have a problem like this in your homework where you have to break it down and use these formulas to figure it out. Okay? So like I said, be aware where the formulas are, uh, that you can use them. Depending on whatever the N is, plug it in, you get your answer. Okay. Key order is 1015. All right. So, 1015. I'm going to call it. I'm not, I don't want to start on area yet. I want to wait and do area all together where we talk about regular area We talk, and then we start in with uh, definite integration. So uh, get to work on the homework. Start working on it. Uh, bring in any questions if you've got any questions when you start working on it. Uh, and we'll answer any questions on Monday as well. Okay. Look and go ahead and start on, on uh, 4.2 and get a jump on it if you can. See what it says. Uh, kind of familiarize yourself with it a little bit before we come in so that you if you do have any questions you can ask them during lecture okay